Hello and welcome back to Total Organic Chemistry. This video we'll be finishing up our discussion on the properties of SN2 reactions and what are all the types of things that can affect the rate of SN2 reactions. In this video we're going to be taking a look at sterics and steric hindrance. By the end of the video, the questions that you should be able to answer are how does the size of the substrate affect the rate of an SN2 reaction? And similarly, how does the size of the nucleophile affect that rate? If you need an introduction or a little bit of review on the properties of SN2 reactions or the mechanism itself, please feel free to subscribe to my channel and take a look at some of the previous videos that I've uploaded on those topics. So steric hindrance will greatly affect the rate of SN2 reactions depending on what reagents we use, so it's very important to know how that works. The most important thing to know is that SN2 reactions are very slow with very bulky, very large substrates or nucleophiles. So a haloalkane like propyl bromide, I can draw that here, is a primary haloalkane and it is not very sterically hindered, so it would undergo SN2 reactions quite quickly. Whereas something like tert butyl bromide, with this very, very bulky tert butyl group, is a tertiary haloalkane, and like I said, is very bulky, so it would undergo SN2 reactions quite slowly, if at all. The same logic applies to nucleophiles. So if I had the ethoxide anion as a nucleophile, it would tend to perform an SN2 reaction pretty quickly, whereas the tert butoxide anion would not really undergo SN2 reactions at all. Instead, it would go through a different pathway that we will talk about very soon in a different video. So why is that the case? Well, to look at that, let's draw some pictures of the transition states of these substitution reactions. So we can imagine an SN2 reaction where we have propyl chloride as our electrophile, and it's being attacked by maybe NaOH, so OH- minus is our nucleophile. And let's draw the transition state for that. So we know that in SN2 reactions, the nucleophile attacks from the back side of the leaving group. So we will have our central carbon here, and it will have a partially broken bond to the chlorine, because that's leaving and it will have a partially formed bond to the hydroxide anion because that's the nucleophile that's coming in to substitute the chlorine. And let's draw our other substituents in for that carbon. We have our two hydrogens. We can draw those coming in and out of the plane. And then the rest of our carbon backbone, we can draw that pointing straight up. And we can see that the methyl group on the second carbon here can sort of clash with the nucleophile with OH- as it's coming in. But what we also see is that the other two substituents on that carbon are hydrogens. And hydrogens are rather small, so they do not really affect the energy of the transition state as much. What we can also do is draw a transition state for this other reaction, where we have a much bulkier haloalkane with all of these methyl groups. And if we draw in the same transition state, so all of the partially formed bonds, and then we can draw in all three methyl groups up here above the reactive carbon center. And now we see that all the substituents on that carbon are going to end up clashing with the nucleophile at some point in the transition state. So there's no orientation where those methyl groups can get away from the nucleophile. So that's when we say that it's much more sterically hindered and it will significantly raise the energy of that transition state to where it will not really be favorable for an SN2 reaction. So that is why the bulkier haloalkane you have, or the bulkier the nucleophile is, the slower that SN2 reaction will be, up to even a point where that SN2 reaction doesn't really occur at all. For our purposes, we can write that methyl groups undergo SN2 reactions the fastest, followed by primary, which is still very fast. Secondary haloalkanes are slower. You can get the reaction to happen maybe by heating it up, but they're still pretty slow. And tertiary haloalkanes usually do not undergo substitution at all in an SN2 mechanism. We'll learn about other mechanisms that they do undergo, but they do not undergo SN2 reactions. 
So for the rest of this video, I want to take a look at some examples where we can compare the rates of two SN2 reactions depending on some of the properties that we've talked about in previous videos. So the things that I want you to pay attention to are, like we just discussed, the sterics of the nucleophile and the electrophile, the strength of the leaving group or the ability of the leaving group to leave, the strength of the nucleophile that you're using in the reaction, and the solvent that we're choosing to use for a particular SN2 reaction. So let's start with these two SN2 reactions here, where we have ethyl bromide reacting with sodium iodide as our nucleophile. And I'm not going to bother to write in the products, but hopefully you can understand that the nucleophile will substitute the leaving group in all of these cases. And for the second reaction, we will have isopropyl bromide. So just adding one methyl group there. So which of these reactions will be faster? Well, this is what we just discussed. This is a case of steric hindrance. So the less sterically hindered haloalkane will undergo the reaction the fastest because SN2 reactions are slowed down significantly with any additional bulk on the haloalkane or on the nucleophile. We can also compare the reaction of ethyl bromide with maybe sodium hydroxide as our nucleophile to the reaction of ethyl chloride with the same nucleophile sodium hydroxide. And which of these will be faster? Well, if you've watched my video on leaving group ability, you should know that bromine is a better leaving group than chlorine because it is less basic than chlorine. So the Br- ion is less basic, which makes it a better leaving group. So because we have the same nucleophile, the ethyl bromide will undergo this SN2 reaction faster. In this next set, we can take the exact same haloalkane, so let's take methyl iodide, CH3I, in both cases. And in the first case, we'll have it reacting with NaOH as the nucleophile, and in the second case with NaSH. So which of these will proceed faster? Again, from my other video on the strength of nucleophiles and of leaving groups, you should also know that SH is a better nucleophile than OH because the sulfur atom is much larger than oxygen and therefore it is more polarizable, which makes it a better nucleophile in SN2 reactions. So this second reaction will actually proceed faster. Let's do another one here with the same haloalkane. So we'll take propyl chloride in both cases, and in the first case, our nucleophile will be potassium methoxide, so KOCH3, so our methoxide anion is going to be the nucleophile in this case. And in the second case, we'll do potassium t-butoxide, so you can write it uh, KOC and then CH33, so three methyl groups, or a lot of times what you'll see is just KO and then TBU stands for the tert butyl group. And in this case, this is again a case of steric hindrance, but this time on the part of the nucleophile instead of the electrophile. So the tert butoxide anion is very, very bulky. It's a extremely large nucleophile, so it is going to be very sterically hindered and it will only proceed very slowly in an SN2 like fashion. Whereas the methoxide anion is quite small and will usually do SN2 reactions pretty quickly. Let's do one more here. Again, we'll take propyl chloride, so the same electrophile in both cases. And this time we'll also do the same nucleophile. So again, our potassium methoxide, KOCH3. And the only difference this time will be in the solvent we choose. So in the first reaction, let's say we're conducting this reaction in methanol. And in the second case, we will do it in NN dimethylformamide, or really commonly written as DMF. So it is very useful to know the solvents that you can conduct reactions in in the laboratory, because most reactions require a solvent, and the choice of solvent is sometimes very important for the reaction that you're performing. So remember that with SN2 reactions, we favor polar aprotic solvents. 
So solvents that do not have any sufficiently acidic protons to hydrogen bond with the nucleophile. So we don't want any protic solvents, like methanol, that will interact with the nucleophile and hinder its progress towards the substrate. So the second reaction with DMF will be much faster, because DMF is an aprotic solvent, so it doesn't have any hydrogen bonding capable protons, and that will make our reaction much faster in the end. What I want to do here at the very end is a mechanism problem, so we'll draw an arrow pushing mechanism for the following reaction. We'll take this butane skeleton with a hydroxyl group on one side, so OH on one carbon, and then on the other carbon we'll have chlorine. And we'll be treating this with sodium hydroxide in DMF. So good SN2 conditions, we have a strong nucleophile, OH-, and a good polar aprotic solvent, DMF. And I'm going to tell you that the product of this reaction has the molecular formula C4H8O. So we need to find some arrow pushing mechanism to make that product in the end. So what mechanism, what first step would make the most sense here? Well, we could definitely imagine the OH from the sodium hydroxide coming in and just performing a straight SN2 reaction on our electrophile. So coming into that carbon right here, drawing our curved arrow, and then just kicking off the chlorine in a very simple SN2-like fashion. So if we take the product that we get from that, and we don't have to worry about stereochemistry at all, because we didn't have any chiral centers to begin with, so we have an a chiral molecule as a reactant, so we will get an a chiral molecule at the end. But what this gives us is a possible product, but not with the molecular formula that I gave you at the beginning. So the molecular formula of this product that we've just made is C4H10O2. Okay, so that's not right. So what other mechanism could we possibly draw for this? Well, another step that I can think of is the hydroxide, instead of attacking the carbon to begin with, can maybe pull off this hydrogen from the substrate. So that OH bond is fairly acidic, acidic enough to have that proton be pulled off by hydroxide, and that's because alcohols and water have roughly the same pKa, around maybe 15 or 16. So we know that the hydroxide here could definitely conceivably pull off a hydrogen from the alcohol. So we end up with water as a byproduct, and then we have an, just an O-, minus, so an alkoxide anion here. Okay, so that's great, but we haven't reached our product yet. So what could be the next step? Well, this is where it's very interesting, because we have a good nucleophile, and we have a good leaving group in the same molecule. So what we can actually draw is the O- minus here wrapping around and kicking off the chlorine from the same molecule. And what that gives us is our cyclic product here. And if we count up all our atoms, we'll find out that it's the same molecular formula as I gave you at the beginning. And this would likely be the major product in this reaction. And the reason I wanted to show you this reaction is that it demonstrates two very important things in organic chemistry. One of those is that proton transfers, so acid-base reactions just moving protons around, occur very, very quickly. And that's because many compounds can act as sort of proton shuttles, where the same proton doesn't have to travel all the way across your reaction vessel, but you can just transfer one proton at a time, a different proton each time, which gives us the same result, in the end, transferring a proton to where we want it to go. The other thing is that intramolecular reactions occur much more quickly than intermolecular reactions. You can think of that like intermolecular reactions that require different molecules to react or to collide. Those are going to be less common, because those molecules have to sort of find each other in solution, and they have to collide in the right way and everything in order to make that reaction happen. Whereas intramolecular reactions, so happening within the same molecule, happen very quickly, because especially for all of these small molecules that we've been working with, 
those different parts of the molecule are already basically right next to each other, so it doesn't take them long to collide and to react with each other. So thank you for watching this video on the sterics of SN2 reactions, and I hope that some of the practice problems that we just did helped you a little bit in determining how SN2 reactions work and what the properties of those reactions are. So as always, please subscribe to my channel and like this video if you enjoyed it or learned anything, and also please consider donating to my Patreon, which I will link below in the description. It helps me continue to create content for you and to continue providing resources for you to learn.